Good afternoon. Thank you for coming today to the Federalist Society event by Attorney Jordan Lawrence on seven things the Establishment Clause does not forbid. I'm particularly excited to introduce Jordan to you all today. Jordan is the Vice President of the Office of Strategic Initiatives and Senior Counsel of the Alliance Defense Fund. He works out of their Washington, D.C. office. Jordan comes to us with an extensive background in religious liberty and First Amendment litigation. He has published opinion pieces in numerous uh, national publications, including the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and many others. His opinion is much sought after by national TV and radio programs, including C-SPAN, the, the Today Show, Fox News, the Laura Ingram Show, oh, the O'Reilly Factor, NPR, and he has even been a contestant on Jeopardy. So Jordan's <laughs> enthusiasm and um, great knowledge in his field is a uh, tremendous asset, and we're very glad to have him here today. So please welcome Jordan Lawrence. And I worked with uh, Emily at the Alliance Defense Fund before she came to law school here. And uh, I came in third place in Jeopardy. And uh, let me just tell you that it's a lot easier to shout at the TV, you know, George Washington or, you know, Mozambique, that's the answer. And when you got the little thing in your hand, they don't activate it until Alex, Alex Trebek finishes speaking the, the question. So you have this split second race. So that even if you know that the right answer is Mozambique, if you don't ring in, then you're locked out. And like they had, when I did it, they had so like some category like legal cases. And I knew every answer and I got, I got locked out every time. So and, so, and then if you try to like beat them to the punch, it automatically locks you out. So. Uh, it's a lot more difficult and a lot more finger speed than brains. You need both of them to win. And uh, the uh, uh, I want to, uh, because as the Federal Society, I want to tell uh, just one shameless name dropping uh, thing that, uh, and then I'd, before I get into my talk, is. Uh, <clears throat> I am a, a personal friend of John Roberts, and I've gotten to work on a number of cases with him when he was uh, uh, the uh, Deputy Solicitor General back in the uh, Reagan and uh, Bush uh, one administrations, and then when he was in private practice at Hogan and Hartson. And uh, <clears throat> when he became Chief Justice, I got to go over and visit him, and uh, he made a big deal about, let it, he, he is a, the couch in his chambers that John Quincy Adams died on, that he had a stroke when he was in the, after he'd been president of the House of Representatives, and he had me sit on it. And, <laughs> and uh, it, it, they've cleaned it up, so, you know, but it, it was sort of a weird, you know, you know, go ahead, sit there. It's where John Quincy Adams died. It's not, you know, like, wow, I gotta, you know, that's gotta be the place where I sit. But I did sit there. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, so we got talking, and this is after he'd been Chief Justice for a few, about six months, and so I said to him, uh, you know, do you have any problems, you know, uh, you know, going to restaurants or, you know, stores and people recognize you and, you know, want to talk to you about your opinion or get your autograph or something like that? And he said, well, he said, not exactly, but he said he had one experience <clears throat> where uh, they were having a sale on shirts at Nordstrom. And so he ran in there to get a shirt and uh, uh, he was uh, handed his credit card or his debit card to the, to the clerk and the guy looked at it and he said, John Roberts, do you ever dream that one day, you know, you could be on the Supreme Court? And he said, no, I've never, never really thought about that and walked out of there. And it never occurred to the clerk that this might actually be John Roberts instead of a guy with the, the exact same name. <laughs> so um, uh, also, I want to, uh, I work for the Alliance Defense Fund. Uh, I have uh, uh, been doing religious liberty work for about 20 years. And that's what the Alliance Defense Fund does. And we have, and I just want to make you aware of this, and I've got some brochures for this. We have uh, a Blackstone Legal Fellowship, a training uh, uh, a program that we have in the summertime, mainly for people that have finished their 1L year, but we do have some uh, ones that have finished their 2L year. Um, they pay you, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, $700 a week, is that right? It's nine weeks, and if I were faster in the math, I'd figure that out. 
Uh, it's a three-part program where you, you just are basically trained for two weeks in Phoenix. We do it at the Ritz-Carlton, but Phoenix in June is not the funnest place to be, so we make up for it by being at the Ritz-Carlton. Then for six weeks, they send you out. And I mean, I'll tell you, you get brilliant people coming in. We're having Steve Calabrese come in uh, this year and some other, uh, Jay Budashevsky, others, uh, Rick Garnett from Notre Dame. Uh, then six weeks, we send you out uh, basically an internship. And we, we're going to have 100 students this year. And 12 of the placements are going to be overseas, uh, mainly in Europe, uh, London, Rome. I think one's in Bulgaria that they have. And then you come back uh, for a week where you have uh, basically judges and law professors come in and say, uh, if you want to be like me when you grow up, you know, be a judge, be a law professor, this is what you should be doing, these are what the steps you should be taking. So I've got some information. We have some Blackstone Fellows here and be uh, happy to talk to you about it. Now, the talk that I'm, I'm going to give here, and we'll leave time for questions, um, and I hope I will have the answers, is uh, uh, seven things that the Establishment Clause does not require. And I know there's a lot of controversy, you know, when you'll have you know, Michael Newdow going crazy over under God in the, Ten Com I mean, in the Pledge of Allegiance, the Ten Commandments monuments, uh, you know, can you say Merry Christmas or not, all these types of things, school vouchers to uh, religious schools, etc. And <clears throat> there is a lot of controversy about that. And I tried to think that there might be more light shed on the subject if this was approached from trying to establish some common ground on what the Establishment Clause does not require. And I think some of the, there's some common myths that are out there that are uh, promulgated mainly by people that have very extreme separationist views that are touted as fact when basically courts have not bought into them uh, or that they shouldn't be buying into them. And I realize that some of this I, I made me on more solid common ground than other ones. But uh, bear with me, and, and we can talk about uh, what I say. But here are seven things that I think the Establishment Clause does not require. And if, and if people would adhere to these, I think we'd have a more balanced, reasonable application of the Establishment Clause about, uh, private, or about religious expression in public life. The first thing the Establishment Clause does not require, it does not require censorship of private religious expression. The Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor wrote in the Mergens case back in 1990, there is a crucial difference between government speech endorsing religion, which the Establishment Clause forbids, and private religious speech, or private speech endorsing religion, which the free speech and free exercise clauses protect. Now, if you've taken constitutional law, one of the things that, that I'll just you know, remind you of, and if you, you, know, if you remember this, you'll know more about the Constitution than about 90% of Americans, and that is only the government can violate the Constitution. We can violate the speeding laws, but we cannot, maybe there's some, you know, like own a slave or something like that and violate the 13th Amendment, but it's basically almost impossible for an individual person unconnected with the government to violate the Constitution. So private religious speech does not violate the Establishment Clause because if in order to have separation of church and state, you gotta have the state involved. If there's no state involvement, just mere state accommodation, for example, there's no Establishment Clause issue. Now, this leads to what I think is the main, one of the main problems with this. So the Establishment Clause does not require censorship of private religious expression, but it also does not require the government to treat religion, especially Christianity, as a hazardous waste that must be eliminated from public life. Now, to put this a different way, the wrong approach is to talk about how inherently religious something is. And if it's really religious, it's unconstitutional. And if it's watered down religious, then it's OK. The issue is, I think, whether it's private speech or government speech, and even if it's government speech, it's not automatically a violation of the Establishment Clause. It's what context it's being used in. Now, let me give you an example of this, uh, of the wrong view. Religion is hazardous waste. That it's like, you know, uh, asbestos in the ceiling tiles. There's religion. We have to, you know, remove everybody from the room, bring in the hazmat squad to remove the panels, that sort of thing. That's how many people approach religion in public square, and I think that that's totally wrong. 
So for example, here's an example of this. This is from a 1980 decision from the Second Circuit where some students in a public high school wanted to have a Bible study and a prayer meeting. They were prohibited from doing it even though student-led groups on about any other subject were permitted. And the Second Circuit upheld that and said, you must single out the religious groups for exclusion. And they said this, our nation's elementary and secondary schools play a unique role in transmitting basic and fundamental values to our youth. To an impressionable student, even the mere appearance of secular involvement in religious activities might indicate that the state has placed its imprimatur on a particular religious creed. This symbolic inference is too dangerous to permit. Its religion is hazardous ways. So, uh, again, remember I said, is it private speech, which this clearly is, so this should be permitted, but also context. So we see religion is hazardous waste when Michael Newdow will stand up and say, I don't want my daughter saying, under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, well, what is the context? Now, you may not agree with this, but at least I want to show you that there's a way. Is saying one nation under God collectively in a room. Now, they let his daughter opt out if she wanted to, but can even willing people, does it violate the Constitution to let willing people say under God, one nation under God? Well, I'm not sure that it's a devotional or a religious statement, but I think it is, I, I think there's a strong argument that one nation under God is a statement of political philosophy, uh, like the Declaration saying that we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. So like, you can imagine a conversation between a Marxist and a more traditionalist-minded American. And the Marxist says, I believe government power and rights flow from the people, the dictatorship of the proletariat. And somebody else says, no, I don't think that that's right. I think that rights are given by God and that the, they're inalienable. The government can't take them away. Well, to put it that way, that's not saying the Lord's Prayer. That's not some sort of religious exercise. That is an expression of political philosophy. Whether, now, people might agree with it or disagree with it, but it's not a devotional statement, even though God is there. And what Michael Newdow is saying is, is that you kind of have this Geiger counter, da -da 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 -da, God, and, you know, and it must be removed. That's religion is hazardous waste, and I think that that is incorrect. Context is very important. Now, sometimes when, when you ignore context, you'll get public schools doing what I think is straining the gnat and swallowing the camel. So they'll forbid their staff people, for example, to say Merry Christmas because it might offend people, it's inherently religious. But then they will do things like this, again, straining the gnat and swallowing the camel. Where the Ann Arbor, Michigan School District and the Montgomery County, Maryland School Districts, in their official curriculums, listed religious denominations that they thought had wrong scriptural views on homosexual conduct. And they would say, these religious bodies are good on homosexual issues. And these other ones, and they would list them, the Roman Catholics, Mormons, Southern Baptists, are bad on homosexual rights. Again, now, you can't say Merry Christmas, but you can have official government statements as to which religious denominations are good in their theology and which ones are bad. Now, I used, in particular, straining the gnat and swallowing the camel to show you the context is important. Some people might say, well, where does that expression come from? It comes from the words of Jesus, from Matthew 25, 24, when he's talking to the Pharisees. And he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and a bunch of other spices and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. Now, I think that if a public school where they're reading a book and uh, some novel, and the novelist says the, the main character is straining the gnat and swallowing the camel, and, and some of the students didn't know what it was, the teacher could uh, copy actual pages from the Bible, this Matthew 25 uh, uh, 23 and 24 passage, hand it out to the students and say, let's read this Bible passage as official part of our English class today and then talk about how this applies to the book. I mean, they're reading 
This is not watered down religion. This is the radioactive word of God from the Holy Scriptures itself. The students are reading it, and I think the Supreme Court has said at least twice, this would be totally permissible because the context is pedagogical and not devotional. So the inherent religiosity, now of course you could read the Bible in a devotional sense and it would raise concerns, especially if people are compelled to participate in a government-sponsored religious act. But the fact that it's inherently religious in and of itself does not tell us whether the thing violates the Establishment Clause. So to go on these search and destroy missions and say, that's religious, that's religious, it must be eliminated, we don't care whether it's private speakers or whatever the context is, is a wrong-headed approach to the Establishment Clause. Third, the Establishment Clause does not require censorship of religious expression because it is confusing to others, especially uh, when it's private speech, that is, especially if younger children could be confused. The Supreme Court in the 2001 decision, Good News Club, said, we decline to employ the Establishment Clause jurisprudence using a modified heckler's veto in which a group's religious activity can be prescribed on the basis of what the youngest members of the audience might misperceive. And Clarence Thomas, in that opinion, went on to say that if the issue is we want to show that the government is neutral about religion, what do we teach children, impressionable youth, about religion if every time religion comes up it gets censored? We teach them religion is something hazardous waste-like or unimportant, and, and it should be eliminated because it's either unimportant or dangerous from public discourse. Uh, that's not communicating uh, neutrality towards religion to impressionable youth, but hostility. Now, the Sixth Circuit in a much more colorful way, express this same concept. We're about the, the heckler's veto, or you, know, you have to protect impressionable youth and censor private religious speech. We believe that the plaintiff's arguments present a new threat to religious speech in the concept of the ignoramus's veto. The ignoramus's veto lies in the hands of those determined to see an endorsement, a government endorsement of religion, even though a reasonable person and any minimally informed person knows that no endorsement is intended or conveyed by adherence to traditional public forum doctrine. The plaintiffs posit a reasonable observer who knows nothing about the nature of the exhibit. It was, a, I think, a, a, a nativity scene in this case. He simply sees the religious object in a prominent place and it ignorantly assumes that the government is endorsing it. We refuse to rest important constitutional doctrines on such unrealistic fictions. So because somebody might be confused is not a reason to censor, uh, especially private religious speech. And I want to talk about what if it's government speech that's you know, saying the religious thing in just a minute here. The fourth thing, so I said, uh, the Establishment Clause doesn't require censorship of private speech or to treat religion as hazardous waste, or always censor it because somebody might be confused. And fourth, the Establishment Clause does not require the government to suppress religious speech because it offends somebody. So let's talk about first, if it's private speakers, the government clearly says there is no heckler's veto to uh, silence a private speaker because somebody is offended. Uh, there's many cases to talk about. I'll just read one where the Supreme Court said, but the fact that society may find speech offensive is not a sufficient reason for suppressing it. Indeed, if it is the speaker's opinion that gives offense, the conse that consequence is a reason for according it constitutional protection. For it is a central tenet of the First Amendment that the government must remain neutral in the marketplace of ideas. Now, what if this is the government speaking? What if the government opens its uh, meetings with prayer, or they have the Ten Commandments on the wall? That might raise a first uh, an establishment clause issue. But our jurisprudence has become so warped by uh, extreme separation groups that we're having this problem in the, in the courts of where they're allowing people with no Article III case or controversy standing to go into court and to bring these lawsuits challenging some government expression. And they're, all, and they're usually, they pay a few nickels in taxpayers, uh, you know, so they have taxes, so they're taxpayers standing, or they are offended observers. So the, the, the ACLU or somebody will come to town, they'll find the village atheist, 
and he'll be the plaintiff and they'll say he's an offended observer. Now, under Article 3 of the Constitution, the federal courts can only hear actual cases or controversy, which means under the rules there has to be concrete injury to the plaintiff that is traceable to the government's actions and is redressable, it can be remedied by the federal, uh, by the federal court. Now, the problem that is happening, if you start saying you can be an offended observer and that gives you standing, is there's no concrete injury. And that I think you need more, that we would get more balance if the courts, and this is happening now, would require actual harm in some sense. And not just, I walked by this thing and I was offended. Now let me give you an example of this. The ACLU brought the lawsuit uh, in uh, Kentucky against the Ten Commandments that was at the Supreme Court a couple of years ago. Now these are quotes from the complaint. Now, so you don't have an actual Kentucky resident. You have the ACLU, and they're using, they're saying, well, we, we have uh, organizational uh, standing, and I mean, the Supreme Court has recognized this, but you can just see how this is really getting attenuated. We have some members that live in Kentucky in this McCreary County where they posted the Ten Commandments on the, court, uh, the, the, the walls of the courthouse and the county building there. This is the harm that they alleged. This is a quote from the... Uh, these are quotes from the actual complaint. That they have members, the ACLU has members who live in McCreary County who transact civil business such as obtaining and renewing licenses, registering property, paying local taxes, and registering to vote. While at the courthouse, they have occasion to view the Ten Commandments display in the courthouse. Now, what harm? Now, I, I think that this is not enough to say, and I, you know, I'm of some minority religion that doesn't believe in the Ten Commandments and I feel like an outsider. I don't think that's, but they don't even allege that. This is what they allege. They view the Ten Commandments, and this is a, again quoting, each plaintiff perceives this Ten Commandments display as a violation of the Constitution. Again quoting, each plaintiff therefore is offended by the continued display. Now, that's pretty wispy stuff. I mean, I see something on the wall of the government building, and I'm offended, and that gives me Article Three concrete injury to go into federal court and to demand, ask for an injunction to have it removed. Now, I personally would be more offended by the, the, the sign that's down the hall at the, at the county building that says, pay your taxes here. But that's another, I digress, that's another matter. Uh, but the question is, is that I do not think that merely being offended by a government sign is sufficient to get you into court to challenge it. Justice O'Connor, for example, wrote in, the in her dissent in the Pledge of Allegiance case, the Constitution does not guarantee citizens a right entirely to avoid ideas with which they disagree. No robust democracy insulates its citizens from views that they might find novel or even inflammatory. So if the walls of the government say, uh, support our troops in Iraq, just say no to drugs, or liberty and justice for all. If people are offended by them, they could not get those things removed. And so people say, well, it's religion and that's different. Well, I would say, well, why is it? I think we could come up with statements that the government could post that would be far more offensive than the Ten Commandments or something like that or One Nation Under God. And there would be absolutely no redress in federal court to have a federal judge enjoin those to be removed. So uh, just because somebody is offended does not automatically give them a right uh, to censor government speech acknowledging something religious, and it certainly doesn't if it's a private religious speaker. Number five, the Establishment Clause does not require exclusion of religious groups from public benefits because they are allegedly a subsidy to religion. Now we have a case that's ongoing at the Alliance Defense Fund uh, out in the uh, East Bay area of California. Contra Costa County has a library system and they have meeting rooms that are separate from the libraries, but you know, right down the hall from them. And at one uh, in Antioch, California, they've allowed the Democratic Party, the local uh, Democratic Party, to have meetings to select candidates for local offices. They've allowed the Sierra Club to come in and discuss what legislation they should support or oppose in the next, uh, election, uh, next legislative session up in Sacramento. Uh, they've allowed a lot of 
mundane community groups, neighborhood societies to meet there. But a, uh, a black woman pastor wanted to hold a meeting there, a worship service, and they prohibited it. Uh, she wanted to do it twice. They said no. The Ninth Circuit, in a wacky opinion, said that this was okay, that, it was, that somehow uh, it, was a, a, it was within the bounds of the Constitution for uh, Contra Costa County to say, basically, everybody can meet here, any community group, except for a worship service. And my friend John Roberts and his other eight buddies voted to deny cert. It's, an, it's under a preliminary injunction, so we're back down, but I was hurt and haven't had to call them up and say, what happened there? And all that. But this is the point. When we were denied cert last October, the Contra Costa official said this was required, that, 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 that they are required to, not, not that this was just their discretionary choice, the Constitution required them to single out the worship services for exclusion because it would be a subsidy, it would be a government subsidy of religion to allow them to meet. Now, let that thing sink in. Okay. Does this mean that Contra Costa County supports the Democratic Party because they allowed it to meet there? Does it support, and, and you know, maybe they got some you know, uh, campaign finance laws that they've run afoul of or have to obey? Or what about the Sierra Club? Does that mean that it agrees with the legislative agenda of the Sierra Club and, the, and they have to come under lobbying rules? And I think the answer is no, just by opening up a building, a room in a building saying, hey, here it is, first come, first served, and whoever comes in from the community, that's government accommodation of freedom of speech and not, there's no endorsement of the views necessarily of the groups that choose to avail themselves of this. This is not, it's not a subsidy. It's not a subsidy for religious groups to take it to avail themselves of something that's generally open to everybody. Because that would be like saying it's a subsidy to religion when the synagogue catches on fire and the city fire department goes and puts it out. Because, see, the synagogue didn't have to contract for private fire protection. And so they're saving all this money by, uh, you know, they, they don't pay taxes anyway because they're tax exempt. And, and so this is government subsidy. It's an in-kind contribution to the synagogue. No, because it's, it's every, you know, everybody. If the Buddhist monastery hooks up to the city sewer system, that's not government subsidy of religion. That's them uh, participating in something that's available to everybody. Uh, you know, is, is Social Security violate the Establishment Clause because they can find people that donate part of their checks to their house of worship? I, it, this to me is an idiotic and an extreme view that would never get applied in any other context, and, and I think this subsidies, subsidy argument should be rejected. The Establishment Clause does not require religion to treat Christianity worse than other religions because it is a majority religion. Now let me just, there's a couple examples I can give of this, but my favorite one was a case that I handled out in Denver about 15 years ago, where there was a public school teacher who taught reading to fourth graders. And, uh, they would have a silent reading time where the students would have to come up and he had this big collection of books of parents and kids had given him books and they had about, about 400 or 350 books and he would read silently. And one day a parent came in at a parent-teacher thing and noticed of the 350 books, he had two old books from the 1930s, black and white kind of comic book, The Bible and Pictures and the Life of Jesus. Then they found out that although the teacher would silently read uh, books on Buddhism. He would read books on Native American religions. He had on occasion read the chapter from the book of Proverbs in the Bible. There's 31 chapters, so he would look at the calendar and read the chapter that matched the date on the calendar. And so the principal said, you have to remove all these religious books, uh, uh, the Christian books, and stop reading the Bible. And so we brought up, well, uh, what about all the, the Buddhist books and the Native American religious books? Oh, no, those can stay. Th th those are okay. So we brought this up and said this violated the free exercise rights, the freedom of speech rights of the teacher, as well as the Establishment Clause. And the judge said, no, it doesn't. And the teacher's name is Roberts. He said, Roberts' teaching of American Indian religion is teaching about religion, 
Now, this is wrong because, I mean, we were talking about reading the books silently. It is but a per part of a secular historical course of study approved by the district as part of the curriculum for fifth grade students. I thought he was a fourth grade, so I guess it was fifth grade. The student's exposure to Robert's religious books and Bible cannot be deemed teaching about religion in the same way. We find that exposure to the tenets of a little known religion, such as those followed in American Indian culture, is far less influential on young students than exposure to a modern day, widely observed religion, which is a recognizable part of society. So if you're obscure and religious, you're okay, because you're cultural, but uh, especially if you're a my, uh, of, a, of a minority group's faith. But if you're what all the white Anglo-Saxons believe, then of course, that obviously violates the Establishment Clause. Now this was also put on display uh, up the road at the University of Virginia, where they refused to fund a student, they fund all student group publications. They refused to fund a Christian group because it was religious, but funded the Muslim and Jewish student publications because they were cultural. In this case, one of the Supreme Court, they declared that unconstitutional in Rosenberger. And then one I just have to relate to you just quickly, when the city of San Jose built a statute to the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl. Now, I would not add, I do not, I would not have urged them to do this, but a bunch of irate citizens said, well, look, if you're going to you know, challenge all this Christian stuff, they filed an Establishment Clause lawsuit. And the Ninth Circuit bent over backwards to explain how a statue of an Aztec god was not a violation of the Establishment Clause. And they would, they would say, like they would talk about how these people would get up, and, and this was to show uh, solidarity with the Hispanic culture of uh, residents of, and, and their culture of San Jose. And, and people would get up and say how much they feel a part of the community, and they would be sobbing up there, and, and you know all of this because Quetzalcoatl was there. And plaintiffs also cite this, you know, when all these people are crying, and these council members, and all that. Review of these statements reveal that they made not, they were not made in a religious spirit, but an homage to the city's Mexican heritage and to the contribution of indigenous peoples to the Mexican culture. It is commonplace that a work of art may affect someone on an emotional or spiritual level, even move someone to tears. This does not imbue the work with religious content. Now, I, I think that that's probably correct, but if we were talking about that this was a statue of Jesus, or the Virgin of Guadalupe, I guarantee you the Ninth Circuit would not say what they did about. So it's again, Christianity is religious, other religions are cultural and not religious. So the inherent religiosity thing goes right out the window. And then I want to end with this. The last one is the Establishment Clause does not require courts to invalidate laws when lawmakers enact them with religious motives. Now. I want to give you one recent example of this, that uh, there's been a lot of litigation over uh, whether marriage can be defined as one man and one woman. And uh, one of the uh, cases at the Washington Supreme Court, they upheld their state law defining marriage as one man and one woman. One of the dissenting judges, though, saw this as violating the Establishment Clause. What we have done is to permit the religious and moral strains of the Defense of Marriage Act in our state to justify the state's intrusion. As succinctly put by the Libertarian Party of Washington and the Log Cabin Republicans, to ban gay civil marriage because some but not all religions disfavor it reflects an impermissible state religious establishment. Now, I think that there's a couple of things that are really wrong with this. Okay, first of all, um, there are many laws that everybody agrees are okay, that religious groups would agree with. So for example, in another Supreme Court case where they challenged the Hyde Amendment, which restricts abortion funding, uh, they said that it codifies Roman Catholic theology into law. And the, the Supreme Court said no. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that, that we have laws on and religions happen to agree with them. It does not follow, the Supreme Court said, that a statute violates the Establishment Clause because it happens to coincide or harmonize with the tenets of some or all religions. Um, it, 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 he said, for example, uh, that, that Judeo-Christian religions oppose stealing does not mean that state and federal government laws uh, may not, consistent with the Establishment Clause, enact laws prohibiting larceny, and on and on. You know, 
uh, I think we should help the poor. Okay, well, then we got to invalidate Social Security and any welfare legislation, uh, you know, because it violates the Establishment Clause, something like that. You also get into a problem when on issues where there's religious groups that are on opposite sides of an issue. So, for example, to uh, Justice Bridge in the Washington Supreme Court, she must be aware that there are religious groups that support same-sex marriage. So uh, does that mean that if they, then I, I, I think it just sort of, the, the benefit of the Establishment Clause analysis just cancels out. So if you're religious groups on both sides, the court can't do anything without violating the Establishment Clause. I mean, if you have, a, if you have an argument about the death penalty, whether you should have it or not, and people are quoting the Bible, then you can either have the death penalty or abolish the death penalty because you're enacting somebody's religious views. And even in this case, the, uh, the, the case where, they, uh, uh, where there was the attack on uh, the Hyde Amendment as violating, and Harris v. McRae on, that have codified Roman Catholic theology, you know who one of the plaintiffs were? The Women's Division of the United Methodist Church. So the United Methodist Church is saying you can't have the Hyde Amendment because it violates the Rome, you know, it codifies Roman Catholic theology. But if they struck it down, then they would be codifying United Methodist theology. So I just think it's a worthless uh, uh, principle to, to assert. Now, I have to then, which I think is very humorous, is to show once again there is a strain the gnat, swallow the camel function with this. That when... This is usually only trotted out when conservative or traditionalist religions people and their public policy issues are uh, at stake. You never hear this when there's a liberal uh, religious group advocating something. So now let me point out to you a case that was decided last year at the Supreme Court where this happened. And you probably didn't even know that there was this big, huge Establishment Clause violation in it. Commonwealth of Massachusetts versus the Environmental Protection Agency was a case you may have heard about whether there was an argument with, with uh, the states, in this case was Massachusetts, saying that the EPA had to enforce the Clean Air Act to regulate carbon dioxide because of global warming. And the Supreme Court and, and, and the Bush administration and the EPA said, no, we don't. And the Supreme Court said, you have to go back and revisit the issue. Um, now, you're thinking, that seems to have nothing to do about religion. But did you realize, and, and I mean, you know, I was looking on the websites of the ACLU and its allies, never saw this, that the National Council of Churches submitted a friend of the court brief saying that the Bible requires the Clean Air Act to be interpreted to require the EPA to regulate carbon dioxide as a, uh, as a pollutant. Now this is what they said, and this is quoting directly from their amicus brief, just last year. This shocking violation of the Establishment Clause. Followers of the Judeo-Christian tradition are called to be responsible, just stewards of the earth and the abundant resources it makes available today and for future generations. See Genesis 2.15 and 9.12. Also, the National Council of Churches told us that Christian ethics, and this is again, therefore the EPA must regulate carbon dioxide as a pollutant. Christian ethics preaches love of our fellow humans as ourselves. See Matthew 22.39 and Mark 12.31-33. And more particularly, uh, particularly, care and compassion for those who are the most vulnerable and needy. See, for example, Matthew 19, 21, 25. You get the idea. Now, I did not hear a peep being raised about this egregious violation of the Establishment Clause, but nonetheless it happened. And, and I mean, I think the Supreme Court's going to have to reverse itself when it realizes that it has codified the doctrines and theology of the National Council of Churches with its ruling on how to interpret the Clean Air Act. So let me end with this, and we'll take some questions for as long as you can stay, and we can eat some more pizza. There should be no treatment of Christianity as uniquely dangerous to the American way of life, or religion in general. There should be no coercion of individuals to, to worship, to do any religious act. There should be no violations of individual conscience as long as you know, the peace and safety of our, order, of our, of our uh, community can be protected. And Justice Brennan, in one of the rare times I'll ever quote him, said it very correctly in 1978. 
The Establishment Clause does not license government to treat religion and those who teach or practice it simply by virtue of their status as such as subversive of American ideals and therefore subject to unique disabilities. Thank you. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Uh, and thank you for letting me come today. <clears throat> and also, if you have questions about Blackstone, I got the uh, brochures here too, and, and come up and talk to me. But anyway, questions about my talk or thoughts. This is the Federal Society, you know, where free debate reigns, unlike many other classes you have here, where you'll be censored and silenced. You know, let me just say this. I, one thing I like, I graduated from the University of Minnesota in 1980. So that was uh, two years before the Federal Society started. And it was really uh, very, very one-sided. And you know, there was, a, there was a code, and you still feel the code do an effect, where you, there are certain things you can't say in the classroom or speak out, and that sort of thing. And the Federal Society gives a sort of protected enclave where you can speak your mind the way the First Amendment says, and not be attacked as a bigot or a horrible you know, Neanderthal or something like that. And I, I'm very glad for the Federal Society. And even though there's nobody debating me, I've been in plenty of debates, and I'll tell you, I've been in debates that I never, ever would have heard both sides of an issue. And this is the other thing. Let me just make one other comment. The, the unfairness of it, and what the Federal Society does well is, is because you're young students, and you get the professors who are in a position of authority and like 20 years older than you, it's, there's this power imbalance. And so they make it sound like, well, because I'm the professor and older than you, uh, whatever I'm espousing is correct, and, and, and you know, your thing is wrong. And I think the federal side by having a debate and bringing in people who uh, kind of equalize the disparities, you get really good debates. Now, not every professor is that way, but I'm just glad to be there. And so there's my little salute to freedom of speech here. So speak away if you have an opinion. Yes, sir. You said that uh, for, for the, I think it was your fifth point about standing in the, in the, the, uh, tenth, the tenth amendment, tenth, not tenth amendment, Ten, ten Commandments cases? Yes. How would you envision a party having standing to violate, to challenge the Establishment Clause? Well, I think there has got to be some sort of requirement that, I mean, this is how I would say it is. I think they would have to be required to either look at it, or here, let me give you an example, which is a little bit easier. If they're saying prayers at the uh, city council meeting, if there was a police officer who objected to it and he said, you're going to lose your job, we're assigning you to you know, be the guard at the city council meeting, and you have to stand there, or, or like there was a, a prisoner in a, you know, a courtroom, if they prayed in the courtroom, and the prisoner was brought in there, something like that. So there's really no way that he can leave, that sort of thing. I think it is wrong to say there's a constitutional right to force the government to say things that never offend you. Because that's essentially what they're saying. Because they have to say, well, that only applies to religious things. And see, to the point where you could have a speech by Louis Farrakhan saying, you know, we should, you know, the Jews are dirty and, and all this sort of stuff. And unless he prays, there's no way to stop. He could speak for an hour about the dirty Jews and there's nothing you can do. But if he prays, then you can censor him. And, and I think that's straining the gnat and swallowing the camel. Either we say you tolerate speech you disagree with and, and, and you have more debate, but I think you have to have something more when it's the government speaking than simply I'm offended by it. That there's got to be, and the ACLU has gotten so sloppy on this. They've had some recent cases kicked out of court they forget to allege in their complaints that these guys have even been to the meetings where they're They just find some guy who says, oh, I'm offended by the fact I heard about it that they're praying, but I've never been to a city council meeting. Oh, man, I, I've been kicked out on standing in cases where we had much, much better than that. And I, I just don't think we, uh, we should give such a free ride to people who are just merely offended. Or if merely, then, or we expand it that anything the government says that offends you gives you a right to go into court and ask for, uh, uh, to silence them. And, and I, I don't think that that's the way to do it. So the only way is to have something that's more, more coercive that's going on with the plaintiffs. Yes, sir. Uh, I, uh, I just, I, I'll say I haven't taken, beginning to take constitutional law now. And I'm fairly unfamiliar with a lot of the case law on the First Amendment. But yes. It just seems to me this whole discussion is taking place in a context which is radically divorced from what the framers actually intended the First Amendment <coughs> Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. You know, when we talk about a courthouse or a fire uh, department, we're not talking about the Congress. And I mean, clearly they were speaking about established churches like the Church of England, or the, there would be no Protestant or Catholic Church of America. And I just wonder if maybe we should be 
lodging our arguments. I don't, I don't know how far we've, or why we've come so far, but I wonder if we should lodge our arguments and focusing on, on the narrow meaning and the, the political meaning. Well, there's been a, Clarence Thomas, he's been the only justice who has said this, has basically asserted uh, something like this. The, the um, just a real quick thing, some of you maybe all be familiar with this, with the, the, the debate on the corp incorporation doctrine. The Bill of Rights were written as a restraint on the federal government. And in 1833, for example, John Marshall wrote an opinion, and he said, the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states. So then in 1867, the 14th Amendment was applied, uh, it was passed, it was enacted, and it said that the states may not deprive people of uh, life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So then a debate came, does either that or the Privileges and Immunities Clause incorporate the Bill of Rights against the states? And the Supreme Court essentially uh, avoided the question for a couple of decades, and then in the 1920s, just started, like without any explanation, just started saying, hey, uh, the free speech clause applies to the states because it's uh, a part of ordered liberty, it's a, it's a due process right, uh, the states cannot deprive you of liberty, your liberty includes your freedom of speech. And then in kind of this piecemeal fashion, they would grab things out of the first eight amendments and apply them to the states. And um, there, and I, I'll tell you, there's some people that just say that's totally bogus. There's other people, like in a libertarian community, that says that that's totally correct. You do that through the Privileges and Immunities Clause rather than the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause. But Clarence Thomas has written a very interesting couple of the opinions. I think uh, the uh, the Pledge of Allegiance opinion, where he said there all the other Bill of Rights are personal rights or individual rights but that the Establishment Clause is a federalism issue and that you don't have an individual right to be free from an establishment of religion. That all it said was is the states can have established religions, but the federal government can't. And that, uh, and that even if you say there is something incorporated by the 14th Amendment, what to incorporate is that the states can't have an established religion uh, or, or, well, you, you would have to have more clarity to that and that, uh, that a person would not be able to come into court and assert that as, as a right. Now, what's interesting is a lot of people oppose that, but now in the Second Amendment case that's the Supreme Court, it's like everybody's flip-flopping. The people say, oh, no, no, the Establishment Clause is a personal right. No, no, the Second Amendment, that's a federalism right that protects the state militias. And there's not an individual right to, to bear arms. And, and so it's sort of interesting to see them flip-flop in, the, in the, those things going on there. So that kind of argument is going on right now. Uh, well, I mean, Clarence Thomas is beating that drum. No one else has really joined them. Uh, but it is stirring up some scholarly debate on you know, what did the Establishment Clause, is it a personal right that is somehow incorporated against the states or not? Yes, Trevor. Your example of the public, school, the, um, the public library and the, um, the Democrats the Sierra Club right. and then the Baptist minister. What sort of uh, group meeting would violate the establishment clause? I mean, I'm thinking of an example where uh, a kind of a radical church wants to bring snake handlers in and have a meeting with snakes involved, and they say, well, you know, this is we don't want to have this at the public library. Well, I think the the you. You know, time, place, and manner restrictions that are neutral. Like nobody can bring live animals in would be okay. <clears throat> um, but I don't think there's ever, and, and, the, and if they want to limit the form, if they say we're only going to allow Shakespearean era plays to be performed in our library meeting room, then you could eliminate everybody else. But you can't say we're open to the community for civic events, and this is usually how these policies are written civic events that benefit the community but no worship services. That to me is unconstitutional because they're, they're, they're saying worship services can never benefit the community. And that uh, you can advocate, uh, like I have a case right now in a public school in New York City where they're, they're, they're uh, urging this. And um, under their policy, this is the kind of thing that I point out, that they have to write their policy, they either say we're gonna let everybody in or we're really gonna limit it. Because under their policy, somebody could give a speech on why you should not get vaccinations for your school-age kids because they're dangerous or whatever. They would have to allow that, but they can't allow, but, but they ban uh, a Catholic priest teaching catechism class. Well, 
you know, to me, th th then it's becoming irrational what they're doing. Like, what would really be of more danger to the school? But if they're going to say, if they're going to do it, they have to let the, the anti-vaccination guy in. When do we have to be out of here? Do we have to break off here soon or? Okay. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. I was wondering why you think that whenever there's an establishment case, an establishment clause issue to me, it seems like there's also free exercise clause issues. And anytime they can say this violates the establishment clause and stay in it, <clears throat> I don't understand why we haven't been more successful on the other side being like, you know, actually, if you do that, you're violating the free exercise rights of this individual, this group, this person. When it's a private speaker, that's true. And in fact, there's been a lot of internal discussion among people that do this. Uh, about 20 years ago, the Supreme Court said, we're going to view these kind of cases as freedom of speech cases if it's a private individual being censored in the name of the Establishment Clause. So it's like Establishment Clause versus Freedom of Speech Clause. But uh, nobody has really, there's just sort of this blind spot of, well, doesn't this also violate the Free Exercise Clause? And we're beginning to raise that more, that that, uh, because you'll get into all these really complicated arguments about the nature of the form and how limited or how expanded it is. And what you're suggesting cuts through all that because you can say how limited or how big a form can be is, is a big complicated discussion. But what the government can't do is use religion as the basis to eliminate people from you, you know, speaking or meeting in a form or something like that. And it doesn't matter whether it's limited or broad or whatever. You just can't use religion as the as the as the disqualifying factor. That violates the establishment clause. Or, I mean, the free exercise clause. And the Supreme Court has more or less said that, but it's sort of like this diamond just sort of laying there in the dust that nobody uses. So we're going to start asserting that and see what happens. But there's kind of like this blind spot you have to overcome to get. To, yeah, I guess that's right. In fact, that would be a good. Uh, law review note issue, I would suggest, on why aren't we using the free exercise clause to decide these cases, uh, some of these uh, public forum cases. I think that that's, I would heartily endorse you doing that, you know, because I, th because I think that's, that's a very good idea. You're very insightful and wise on that because you're agreeing with what I'm thinking. So, <laughs> other questions or thoughts? Okay, Emily, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much.